Hello. Yeah, so I'm Ben. I'm from the University of Manchester, and I'm here to talk about some work we've done recently in Guatemala, trying to measure ash dynamics passively from the ground. Uh, this is quite a big collaboration. It, it, it didn't start out big, but it turned into quite a big one, so I'd just like to thank everyone that sort of helped me along the way, because there's lots of things in here that I didn't really know too much about to start with. Cool, so I'll, I'll start off by sort of talking about how or why we want to detect ash, and I've made this sort of quick, funny cartoon. I did have a list of words earlier, but I thought that would be a bit, a bit too boring. There's several reasons. So here we've got our volcano, and it's spitting out this big ash bloom, uh, and we've got several different impacts on, on human life. Starting, the big one is really plane travel. Uh, everyone remembers the big uh, Icelandic eruption in 2000, uh, 2010 that effectively shut down Europe, and there's very big financial impacts because of that. We also have other infrastructure, so down here I've just got some power lines. Uh, ash settling on power lines can cause them to short out uh, and, and just generally to damage those. And there's also things like water systems and transport as well that uh, volcanic ash can really impact. Um, another really important one is uh, one of the big things we do with volcanoes is we try and measure the amount of gas we've got coming out. So here we've got some sulfur dioxide in our, in our ash plume. And uh, it's really difficult to measure, or to correctly measure, the amount of sulfur dioxide that's coming out of a volcano when there's ash in the plume. It, it interferes with our measurements, so it sort of confuses all the satellites um, that are trying to measure that. And lastly, we've also got the sun shining down, sort of being reflected off the ash plume. Uh, so, in the, especially in the vicinity of the volcano, uh, volcanic ash can uh, block direct sunlight, leading to sort of nighttime conditions. This doesn't really have a big impact globally on climate. It's more the other aerosols that volcanoes put out, so like the sulfate aerosols that really have the big impact on climate. Volcanic ash isn't too, uh, too big a player, but in the local environment it is quite important. So, how do we detect ash at the moment? Well, I've split this into both ground-based and satellite measurements, and also into active and passive measurements. And what do I mean by active and passive? Active is where you have a controlled light source, so either you output, as this little cartoon shows, you output light and then measure the reflection, or you output light and measure the transmission through a plume, depending on the setup of your equipment. Passive is using a, well, like as it says, a passive light source, so in some cases the sun, in some cases it can just be the thermal emission of the plume itself. So there's several different uh, methods at the moment. We've got LiDAR, radar, infrared, visible, and also from satellites UV. But one thing you'll see is there's no, uh, there's no UV from ground. And we thought, well, this is, we have a lot of UV instruments on the ground trying to measure the gases that come out of volcanoes. Can we also use these to measure ash? So that's what we tried. So I'd like to present what we did on that. And that's a, a new system to passively measure ash from the ground um, using depolarization of scattered sunlight. So you might ask, why depolarization of scattered sunlight? That's a very good question. Um, so ash is a very non-spherical particle. It's formed by fragmentation of uh, the magma as it rises through the conduit. And it means that the particles themselves are very jagged and not very spherical. Uh, so and and non-spherical particles induce a change in polarization on scattered light. And this means we can differentiate them from the other particle, uh, the other aerosols, such as the sulfate or water droplets that come out of volcanoes, which are typically spherical in nature. Um, we use sunlight because the scattered sunlight in the sky, if you look up in the sky, you, there's actually a, a pattern of polarization in that light. And you can tell this if anyone's got a pair of polarized sunglasses, if you sort of tilt your head in, on a sunny day, I know there's not many of those around here, but if you tilt your head on a sunny day, you should be able to see the sky lightening and darkening. So we're trying to use that as our light source. Now, uh, unfortunately, it's not steady. The, the degree and angle of polarization are functions of time and the viewing angle, and this is because it changes with the position of the sun. So we've got this little cartoon here that's spinning around. Um, the black spot here are areas of uh, low polarization, and that's where the sun is. And the, the red bands are areas of high polarization, and then a sort of a rainbow pattern in between. And these change over time, um, so it, makes, it can make a quantitative analysis quite difficult. Cool, so how do we measure these? Well, we wanted to make it as light as possible, and we've got two UV cameras here. Now, these are actually used quite a lot in volcano monitoring to measure the flux of sulfur dioxide, and as uh, Matt will talk about later on. Uh, so I won't skip too much on those, but one key important is that these devices are already out there being used, and all we do is change the filters on them. So that makes this method very cheap, which is good for volcano observatories. Uh, so what do we have? On each of these cameras, we've got a lens, as normal. We've got 380 nanometer band filters to try and select the wavelength of light that we want. And we've also got a polarizing filter on the front. So on the top one here, we've got a, a vertical polarizing filter. And on the bottom one, we've got a horizontal polarizing filter. So we're measuring two orthogonally polarized channels at, at the same time of the same wavelength. So for each of these channels, we, we acquire an image. Uh, we then divide that by a reference image taken um, earlier on in, in, uh, in time. So just sort of the pattern of the sky as it is uh, normally. 
We then take the ratio of these two images to try and um, take a depolarization ratio, and this makes our depolarization images. Now, I'll show what those look like in a minute, um, but first, a little uh, look at how we actually analyze the data. So, first of all, here we've got uh, just a raw image. So, this is your normal, uh, just like as if you take a snapshot with a normal camera. Uh, and this is an example of one of the plumes that we're measuring. Um, I'll talk more about the volcano in a minute. And you can see here, you've got this big spike in the intensity uh, due to reflections on the plume edge. Uh, and then you've got this dip where the ash is in the middle. And then this little bit here is a dip in the ash that's raining out the plume on this side. And you can see it's not really very visible in the normal images. And on the second one down, we've got transmittance where we divide our normal image by our reference. And you can still see there's a bit more of a dip, but it's not very clear. But then if we then go to depolarization, you can see the signal compared to the plume is much more significant and a lot easier to see. So we get a much bigger signal to noise using this uh, depolarization measurements than we do with just normal imagery. So where do we take our measurements? We went to Guatemala, uh, to uh, Santiaguito, which is a dome complex here of a leftover from the Santa Maria volcano, uh, of a, an ancient eruption that sort of well, demolished the side of the volcano. And these domes are growing up through that uh, eruption scar at the moment. Um, here it is in Central America, you can just see it there in Guatemala, and this is a picture from our observation site of one of the explosions sort of kicking off um, at the very start. We also, when we were there, so we were measuring with our cameras from this location here, and a bit closer to the, to the dome we also uh, collected some ash from the ground uh, by laying out, uh, so this is ash that was falling out uh, from some of these explosions that occurred. I should say that Santiaguito volcano is a very good volcano for doing these measurements. Um, it exhibits sort of regular ash-rich explosions about every two hours or so, and this makes it, makes it a perfect uh, natural laboratory for doing these measurements. Cool, so this is just a, a quick animation. So on the right here we've got our depolarization images, and on the left we've got this, uh, the cross-section given by this blue line. And you can see as it goes on, you've got a really strong depolarization from the main eruption plume coming out here. But you can also see, as I pointed out in, the, in the, one of the previous slides, uh, as it sort of cycles through, you can see ash settling out in this region down here. And this really excited us, because maybe we can then use this technique to measure the dynamics of an ash plume and the settling speed uh, of ash falling out, uh, which is a big key input for um, ash uh, dispersal models uh, to try and, uh, so given a certain eruption, you need to know how fast ash is falling out to see how far it'll go. Uh, so uh, we really want to investigate this and see if we can use it as an input for models. Um, you might be able to see at the top here, you've got some weird stuff coming in, and this is actually from reflections from normal meteorological cloud. So this is, our, our assumptions in our method assumes that we're getting transmitted light. Unfortunately, it doesn't work for reflected light which also means that for the main plume, it can be quite difficult to try and determine what's reflection, what's transmission, and that's something we're trying to work on a bit more. Um, so, but I'll focus mainly on this sort of setting region down here where we are pretty certain that it's transmitted light, uh, and so that it is ash that we are measuring. So, after creating our normal depolarization image and saying, yes, there's ash there, good, what do we do with that? Well, we try and measure the flow speed, and we do this using an optical flow model. Um, now, this is basically, it just takes a series of images and identifies features, features in those images and tracks them from frame to frame to give you a movement speed. And what we do is we identify two regions. First one is the main plume region, uh, where our eruption is uh, taking place, and the second is in this down, downwind region. Um, the arrows aren't too clear to make out there, but you should be able to see they're going up in this one, they're going sort of down diagonally in this one. Um, so these are our two main regions of interest. To measure the speed, obviously we've got a little bit of noise coming around the edges in places where there definitely aren't ash, so we applied a sort of a mask to the, these images and only uh, investigated the pixels that were of a certain depolarization value uh, above 1.05 uh, to, to identify where our ash is. Now, this is a very slow GIF. It should be a bit faster than this, but I think the laptop's sort of struggling with it. It's a bit big on the file size, unfortunately. But you should be able to see as the explosion goes on, um, you've got the, uh, the ashes blowing up here, and again, it's, it's sort of falling down here. You might not be able to see that too well on here, actually. Da -da 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 -da. I'd say it's usually a little bit faster than this. You can see the impact of the cloud again up here. <coughs> There we go, so that's the eruption taking place. We've got the, it's going up here, and as it's coming down here, and it's sort of being spat out in bursts as it, um, as it settles out. Anyway, I'll skip past that. So we can take the average velocity in these two regions and see what that tells us about the plume dynamics. So first of all, the orange line is the main plume. Uh, the dots are the actual measurements, and the line is a five-point moving average, to make it a bit clearer. And you see we've got this nice sort of pulsatory uh, uh, pattern in our measurements, which matches uh, what we get from um, 
uh, it matches some of the uh, models that we see uh, for the uh, dynamics of Santa Gita. Uh, and on the bottom here, we've got the blue line, which is our downwind region, our settling region. And you can see there's, in, there's these sort of three main peaks in here that correspond to three clumps that sort of fall out of the plume. And so we measure these sort of falling velocities and also the, the rising velocities. So in the main plume, the rising velocities we measured between about four and six meters per second, which is a little bit slower than we might expect, but it is still within range of measurements taken before, which range between about three to 15 meters per second for the main plume in this sort of buoyant region. Uh, and for settling velocities, we retrieved about between 0.5 and 1.5 meters per second. So once we had those, we wanted to try and compare them to ash samples taken on the ground. So we, uh, we took some samples. There were, the samples we took here were taken two days after uh, the explosions that we measured uh, using our cameras. Unfortunately, we couldn't do both explosions and uh, taking camera measurements on the same time uh, due to um, just difficulties in the field. Um, so this is an example of a backscattered electron uh, image of some of the ash sample. And this was then sorted into sizes using dry sieving. And the size is typically, uh, so we're looking at particles of a diameter between about 0.05 to 0.2 millimeters. Um, and see, so how does that compare to our, our ash samples that are falling? Well, we can try and get an idea of the diameter from the settling speed using a terminal settling velocity uh, equation. So using this equation and our sort of settling velocity we got, we can get a diameter. And our diameters are about 0.5 to 1.6 uh, millimeters. No, that's not right. Sorry, that should be 0 0.05 to 0 0.16 millimeters. Sorry about that. So it does, they line up very nicely within, our, uh, within the measurements that we measured on the ground. So to sort of wrap up, we've demonstrated that you can passively detect ash uh, using existing qu equipment that's already widely used in volcanology. We're also able to detect and tra track ash using high frame, with high frame rates, which allows us to investigate plume dynamics. Uh, there are limit limitations in that there are artifacts due to reflections, and obviously this uses data, uh, this uses sunlight, so it can only work during the day. There's no nighttime measurements possible. Uh, and sort of looking forward, we want to do f uh, further validation with other methods that already exist, so for example, LIDAR. Uh, and we also would like to implement this into a uh, current monitoring network so we can get a full sort of um, a constant measuring uh, in a permanent station. Uh, so I'll leave that up. I think I'm a bit short of time, so thank you very much. Thank you.